camera over to Valerie. Um, Valerie Albuquer um, is our first speaker of this evening. And uh, for over 16 years, she has served as the director of the Visiting Artist Program at the Department of Art and Art History at the University of Colorado in Boulder. This position allowed her to work with artists, curators, and scholars from around the globe. It also introduced her to the founding members and participants of the Art Knots. She has been a member of the group for 10 years and has the, had the opportunity to travel to Korea, Sarajevo, and Mexico to participate in shows. Her formal training is in printmaking. Most, rec most recently, she works with fiber and textiles. So with that, Valerie, would you please turn on your camera and mic and you can take it away. Okay, hello everybody. Um, this is a new experience for us all, isn't it? And um, I want to thank everybody at CVA for putting on such a fabulous show. I know that I really enjoyed being able to go into the gallery and be able to view live art. So thank you. Thank you so much for all your hard work. The show looks great. Um, the piece that I have um, up in the show, as is seen here, is um, titled Reducing the Odds of C12H22011, AKA Malaria. Um, when I got, when I have just been living um, abroad for the past three years, um, I know I mentioned in my bio that I, I was in, in the visiting artist um, director for 16 years, but I got to a point in my career where um, I really felt that um, there was a lot more um, to life. And in particular, um, Trina, who's also going to be speaking tonight, she and I did a trip um, to Sarajevo for one of the um, exhibitions, the Art Knock exhibitions, and, and being able to um, be in a place where the art is being exhibited is quite strong and that solidified my desire to um, to travel and to live abroad and so after working at CU for 16 years I left my position and kind of joined the circus of the Peace Corps and went over to serve in Thailand for 27 months. Um, living in Thailand was a very different experience, mostly because you're dealing with a culture that that um, puts value on community and and put versus the individual. And so um, when when this call for walls um, came out, I really wasn't thinking of I mean, I, I had let all my walls down. And so therefore, I was thinking of walls that protect versus walls that that um, that divide. And so this piece that you're looking at, the blue netting is um, is mosquito netting. And most people have a, some version of this that they sleep under every night in order to protect themselves from um, the, the mosquitoes that are infected with malaria because they are typically biting um, between 10 and 2 at 10, 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock in the morning. And so in order to protect yourself and your family, you need to have be sleeping under netting. And um, not that I was always sleeping under this, but whenever I was in my room, this would be, I would have to be under this, this netting um, structure in order to protect myself from being from being built. So this is literally a recreating my my the, the space that I slept in and the room it, because it was part of my room. Um, one of the things that I did each night while living in this in this environment was an art project where I was collecting um, I was struck by how hard people work and I was struck by how hard people work in um, really hard in a hard environment. It is incredibly hot. It's almost 100 degrees every day with 90% humidity. And yet people are out in the fields, they're planting rice, they're cutting down sugar cane, they're carrying things on their back. And so what's inside this tent are, are bags that I collected and then I embroidered them. So every night I was sitting sitting here 
oftentimes on the floor because I did not have furniture um, until maybe six months into my my residency. Um, so I would just be sitting here in the middle of this net um, embroidering. So if we go on to the next slide, um, I, I would collect these plastic bags that represented things that were being grown. Um, bat these All these bags had to be carried by somebody to get from point A to point B. This was, these, this was, um, these were soybeans. And so I collected bags that I found to have a, an interesting graphic component and, and embroidered that. I'd say for a detail, we can go to the next slide. Oops, I guess it wasn't a detail. And then this is a sugar company. Um, so sugar, lots of sugar is made. We have, they have more sugar there than I've ever been exposed to delicious sugars. This was a brown sugar um, bag that would be delivered to, to um, delivered for sale at, um, at different shops. And then the next slide. And then this was um, another bag that I embellished. And then we can go on. This was my actual living space. And so you can kind of see here, I did, I did finally get a little table. I did end up getting um, a chair and then all of my, my, my yarns are on the floor. So the blue space was where I would actually sit and read and, and do my artwork. The pink space was where I would sleep. Um, so and you can go on to the next slide. Um, this, I think this piece is also in the show um, and it's sugar. So the main crops, the main things that are being produced and carried on people's backs are rice, ice, fertilizer, um, sugar, um, uh, uh, feed for animals. I mean, everything has to be carried and um, people are doing this all manually. So I was just really intrigued by what uh, the work, the work that people had to do and um, wanted to pay homage to them. Um, so part of the, the reason, the reason that I was over in Thailand was, was working with the Peace Corps was because I was working with children and um, I felt that it was really important to introduce them to the arts. And so I also, in addition to doing my own art, I would, um, I think we can go on to the next slide. Oh, here's a detail of, of the embroidery. And we can go on to the next slide. Then one, one became 20. And um, so typically what I would do in the process here is I would take up a, a picture of, um, of who it was that I was collecting the bag from so that I could document my travels and I could also document the worker. And I think if we show this next slide, I might be able to show up oh, now here's some more um, just in in my living space. Um, there's you ha I had a lot of windows, but there is no there were no screens on any of, of these windows. So we go on to the next slide. I keep wondering, I, I had a hard time putting this in. So this was, oh, we, if we can go back. So this was a, a man who was delivering ice. And so as I was starting to say, the, my process would be that I would um, collect a bag and document the purse, the worker, and um, then be able to kind of show, show them in their in their environment and also pay honor to the work that they were doing. OK, so next slide. And then I worked on a project where I was working with Buddhist monks. And in this particular piece, I was incorporating art and the fact that each day of the week has a different um, has a different pose of the Buddha. And so I would have them draw the pose of the Buddha because they were very familiar with with the Buddha. And then in to practice their English, they would then be telling me more about about the Buddha stance or the the uh, mudra that the Buddha was in and and why that was important to them. 
Um, next slide, please. And then I was working with a grade school children. And again, I, I really was trying to get them to tell me about their homes and their families. And so I would have them draw pictures and then they would be able to tell about what was in the picture and they could start to practice um, practice their English and and they are very shy people. So it was always difficult to get them to draw to draw themselves out and to be able to um, to practice and to speak to foreigners and and just to to speak in a second language. Next slide. So these were all of my students. Next slide. Um, again, talking about their family and their home. Next slide. And these were I was working with kindergarten to eighth grade, eighth grade, and then again novice monks and working in a university. So the way in which I, I really feel that service is a big part of of what it is that I'm trying to do. Um, a lot of my artwork revolves around um, working with with found imagery as and found objects as I try to incorporate them into um, the challenge of of um, the art, maybe an art knots um, project. And this was a way in which for a way in which I could respond to walls being protecting these children and protecting families as I was breaking down the walls of um, and being being a, a member of their community. And um, so it was a really rewarding experience. And um, I learned a lot and had a wonderful time being able to share my gifts with with these people. Next slide. I'm not sure if we have any more. I think that's it. Um, yeah, that's that is the end of of my um, my little presentation of reducing the odds of I've got to read it because I could never remember it. C12 H22011 aka malaria. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for that Valerie. That was so fascinating to hear about your experience in Thailand with the Peace Corps. I love love to hear more about that. But we do have a question from a guest from Heather, she says, I love these, they're so beautiful. Can you speak to the colors you have for the mosquito nets, the walls, working and sleeping? Um, well, Thai, Thai, the Thai people love color. And so they they have all sorts of very vivid sleeping nets and, and everything that they wear is very, very, very colorful. I just happened to try to find the largest um, structure that I could because otherwise I was just feeling, you know, very small in my living in my living space. But um, the color, the color just represents their love of color. And then Kristen asks if you dyed the tent blue or you found that. Oh, I I found it. I wish I I wish I dyed it. I did end up teaching myself um, dye the, the the process of dyeing indigo. And I became fascinated with shibori and indigo, and um, that was also one of the things that my my village just couldn't understand why I would be immerse, immersing myself in blue dye and having blue hands and fingernails because that was really mm -hmm. considered to be um, a peasant's job and not necessarily somebody who was educated and a teacher. There there was a lot of of um, of uncertainty or, or, or yes, uncertainty. Like, why would this, why is this foreign woman taking on the crafts of, of our, of our hill tribe? And, but it was a fascinating process. I, I did not dye my net though. <laughs> so Valerie, I'm really interested in something you said about um, the cultural difference of the value they place on the community versus the individual. So as an artist, um, you know, we all know that's a very individual practice for the most part. Um, mm -hmm. Even being part of a collective, the, the actual art making is very individual. Did you feel that that experience working in Thailand for two years impacted your way of making art at all? Well, I mean, because I was still working on my own and I was kind of an island unto myself, I I was still I was still doing my own work, although what I did find that I would do is 
I would include my students in the process. So I would hand things over to them and allow them to take on the finish or, you know, just take on the experience. And so I do really um, feel like it has changed my need to be in control and to really, I really feel like I'm, I'm much more open to collaboration and really want to take that on. Oh, that's really cool. What mm -hmm. a great thing to take away from that experience. Yeah. Um, we have another question from Adrian. Um, what would you say to artists about travel and how do people get started traveling if we haven't? Oh, well, you just get a passport. Well, no, you don't you know. It's like, no, it's <laughs> such a hard, that's a hard response. But um, you just have to, you just, have to let go of fear and allow your heart to open up and to be open to new experiences and as an artist you just can see the beauty of life in in everything and i think that you know there's lots of residency programs out there that if you're looking for a way in which to be be grounded in in your travel that might be a a, an idea to look into residencies, apply for residencies so that you've got a mission or to really, and what I did was I really embraced all of the arts and crafts that were surrounding me in the, in the um, minority tribes and just watched them and, you know, sat at their, at their feet and gave, gave honor to their traditions. And, um, you know, I just was a sponge and so find something you like and just give it a try. And one of the beauties of being an Art Knots member is that you do get to travel to really interesting places that open your eyes to experiences that you never thought you would be stepping into, hearing stories, talking to people, and, and then you're part of the community. Yeah, that's a really great point. Um, at our last artist talk last week, Martha, um, had the opportunity to really talk about the Art Knots, how it got started and, and all the traveling that you do as a group. And it's so fascinating the way the, the group, the collective um, really focuses on showing art in places that hasn't seen, where they haven't seen contemporary American artwork. Mm -hmm. um, and so she talked about the DMZ and the uh, remote village on the border of China and Russia, and yeah. just some really incredible, Sarajevo, really incredible places. Yeah, you really get to share share other people's experiences and you realize people just love that you're paying attention to them and that you're you're sharing stories and and that you're one, you know, that we're not separate, that walls are a construct of our of our mind and our government. So um, it's people to people interaction that opens opens you up so much. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much yeah, for joining us you. this evening and thank you for being part of the exhibition. Yeah, oh, thank you. I really appreciate all the time and energy. So I'll, yeah, I'll turn it's off a wonderful. My, okay, turn, thanks, turn Valerie. Off my camera. Thank you. I'm looking forward to hearing everybody else. So one thing that I uh, forgot to mention um, in my opening remarks is that we have uh, two more evenings of these artist talks, and I'm going to post that in the chat in just a moment, um, a link to our website where you will see the dates and uh, times for the upcoming talks is, uh, along with the list of um, the artists who will be speaking. And I also wanted to um, take a second to acknowledge the staff at CBA um, I usually do this in our live events, the opening or artist talks in the gallery, but we don't have that opportunity this time around. So I just wanted to give a shout out to all the staff at CBA who worked really hard to get this exhibition up and who've been doing a lot of behind the scenes work to make these artist talks happen. This is an experiment um, for us. So big thanks to Adrian Christie, who's um, a member of the art department at MSU Denver, and to Jenna Miles, who's helped make this artist talk possible to Kristen Smith and all the students who manage the install and um, Katie Taft, who's doing the education programs. Um, they are just a wonderful crew to work with and I'm really honored to have them with me at CBA. So with that, I will introduce our next speaker. Um, I don't know if Gail is, uh, is 
can hear me, but Gail, if you can hear me, if you could turn off your camera, because right now your camera is front and center on everyone's screen. Um, I'm sorry to call you out, but it's really, it's hard for anyone to know because our faces are down at the bottom and you can't tell that you are highlighted. Um, our next speaker this evening is Trina Bumiller. Trina is a graduate of the R Rhode Island School of, uh, gosh, okay, let me start over. <laughs> <laughs> Trina is a graduate of the Rhode Island School of Design and spent a year with RISD in Rome, Italy. After graduating, she lived in New York City and worked for Betsy Parson and Jack Tilton Galleries pursue and pursuing her own studio work. Since moving to Colorado, she's exhibited her work nationwide in galleries and museums, and I will add um, um, worldwide as well. And she has been reviewed in Art, Amer Art in America, Art News, and the New Art Examiner. Her work has been commissioned by the Four Seasons, the Peninsula Hotel, Hong Kong, Jacobs Engineering, and she's also in the corporate collections of Chase Manhattan, HBSC, and CenturyLink. Public collections include the city of Denver, the state of Colorado, the University of Iowa, and the Japanese consulate. Um, Trina currently lives and works in Denver and Fraser, Colorado. So at, with that, I will let Trina take over. Thanks, okay. Trina. Hi. <laughs> Um, hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, this is a new experience for me as well. And um, I'm very grateful to CBA, to Cecily, to Jenna, to Adrian for um, hosting this tonight and for hosting our exhibition. Um, I almost cried when I saw it. It was so beautiful walking in for the first time. It's beautifully displayed and I hope that everyone is that is local that can um, will go down and see it because I think it's important to see the art in person. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about where how I got to my work so you won't see the actual work until the end. I'm just going to talk about where it came from. I think that's something sometimes people want to know about work and um, my journey with this piece about walls actually started here at the CBA. This is um, that pink um, project on the right was for an exhibition with another collective called Pink Progression. And it was a piece um, related to the women's movement, but also to the um, environmental movement. And in it, I depicted all 129 national monuments that at the time and currently are still being threatened by the current administration. One of those national monuments was Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument, which you can see in the center of the detail panel on the left. And then I actually made another painting of it as well. So that um, square yellow painting is also a painting of Oregon Pipe um, Cactus um, from the National Monument. And the reason I um, am focusing on this one is that it happens to be right on the border of uh, Mexico and the United States. And it is an area that is being very hotly watched and contested and where there actually is a piece of the border wall being built. Um, there's several reasons for this. One is that it is actually federal land, so it's easier for them to seize it and build the wall. Um, if you go to the next slide, I can talk some more about the area down there. Um, and so in Arizona, um, the landscape is very barren and dry. It looks like this along the border. Um, it's very much desert, and um, but there's also these beautiful features of the of the landscape. On the left, you see a saguaro cactus, which is um, often get to be quite quite large and lived hundreds of years. And on the right, you see the organ pipe cactus. This happens to be a fairly young one, not as big as the one that I depicted in my painting. Um, but these cactus only grow in the Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument, so they're very special. So the idea of building a border wall there and destroying these cactus in the process is, is very devastating. Um, there's other factors that um, come into play. The, um, the wall would cut across my animal migration patterns. It would also threaten the saguaro cactus and other endangered animal species. And perhaps most important of all, there's a Native American tribe that lives there. Um, their artifacts and their ceremonies and their burial grounds are in this national monument. And a lot of that would be destroyed in the building of this wall. Um, and again, all of this um, is still um, in light of the, the very human toll that building a wall would take um, to 
cut across the land to prevent people from traveling, from migrating, to separate families, and then the countless deaths. There have been 7,000 deaths in the Arizona desert um, since this wall, um, have, have this barrier has been built. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, I can, well, actually, I want to keep talking about this one for a minute. Uh, and then the other thing that's um, interesting about the idea that it's in Arizona is that my mother happens to live there. And the first thing I thought of, actually, when I heard about this exhibition about walls was um, her own sickness. She has dementia. And dementia in itself, um, as many of you probably know, is a sort of wall that keeps you from um, knowing someone when they lose their memories, you lose their experiences, their ability to communicate um, anything about the past or the future. And um, and so it, um, there are her, her own wall has been put up and it separates um, her from her loved ones and her friends. Um, so when I go to Arizona, and I go quite frequently, she lives there in a memory care unit along um, near my sister, Karen. And if you're watching, Karen, hi. <laughs> um, and one of the things I do with her is I put her in the car and I drive her to places out in the desert. Um, first of all, it's beautiful. It's a chance for her to get out. And it's a chance for me to see these places and also to do my research. But most of all, it's a chance for us to connect because we only need to talk about what's in front of us, not the past or the future, but the present and what's what's here in the here and now. And my work often has um, dealt with the landscape and memory and this idea and, and primarily because of her in the last 10 years or so. So you can go on to the next slide. Um, on one of my recent trips there, I did get very close to the Mexican border um, and you start to see signs like this as you're driving down and then actually in the park itself, you'll see a sign like this, which is kind of unfriendly and sinister um, when you think about the fact that you're in a national park and you should be enjoying the wildlife and the natural features. Um, there's other even more sinister signs that say, please do not feed or give water to anyone that you encounter. Um, so uh, this is this is what made me realize that this this area and this subject might be something that would be worth researching and um, making uh, making artwork about for this show. You can go to the next slide. Um, and so the wall actually, and I would like to um, rename it Trump's wall, is being built. It is um, currently being constructed. There were a number of prototypes. Um, presented. Uh, of course, they chose the most expensive one, which happened to be consisting of um, these steel bollards that are 30 feet tall. Uh, they're set, they're square pillars set at an angle and filled with concrete. Um, they are about 12 inches wide when you look at them um, head on, and then there's about a six inch gap in between them. Um, you can find this information by going online. It's hard to know exactly how much of the wall has been built so far. I think it's maybe about 18 miles. This is on a border that is 18, almost 1800 miles long. So you can see they haven't gotten very far with it, but what they've done so far has been devastating. They're bulldozing a 60 foot wide swath across the desert. They're going through these uh, sacred areas. Um, they're cutting off these migration patterns, and they're also draining a sacred pool of water, a lake, um, to use for the concrete and building the wall. Um, so there's a lot of horrible um, repercussions from this. And, and again, not to mention the human toll that it's taking. Um, and you can keep, and uh, not to mention also the expense. Uh, I believe it was something like uh, 21 million dollars 21 million dollars per mile of wall and 66 billion total for the whole wall and that's as of today if it keeps going of course the cost would increase um so keep going next slide um, so I wanted to do something that expressed the enormity of this. So I wanted to make something big and also express something of the physical feeling of being at the wall or near the wall. And so I devised a painting that was made up of wood panels, uh, the dimensions of which would echo those of the wall. They're 12 inch wide panels with um, smaller six inch wide in ones in between. But I have reversed it. I've made positive, negative, negative, positive. And rather than completely obliterating the the dark areas as if it was steel, I decided to make it a night a night 
um, vision of this landscape, of this desert landscape. Um, mostly because I just wanted to give a sense of this idea of that crossing the border, you would do it at night, it would be somehow mysterious and dark, but also something um, sort of pleasant as well, thinking that you might be crossing over. Um, it's also, of course, very dangerous, which is denoted by the cactus itself and then these bars that are like a prison. Um, so these are quite, this is the, this is a sketch, the, one of the original sketches and then the watercolor that I use um, to make my work. And I often do this to plan out my work. I have lots of ideas coming in, but I need to know um, how the work is going to, to develop, um, especially when you're working large and you don't want to waste materials. Um, these, so these are on 80 inch tall panels that are 12 inches wide. And then the smaller ones are 80 inches high by six inches wide. And you can go on to the next slide and I can show you a little bit about how I make them. So this is the panels lined up in my studio, which I happen to actually the wall behind me is the wall that you see there. And um, I just prop them up. I gessoed them, I prepared them, I cut them to size, and then I just put them up and started sketching um, my cactus and laying out the composition. And I wanted it to be a big, beautiful landscape of this of this desert. Um, I kept going back to the beauty of this landscape and how tragic it is that it's being destroyed in, in the name of this horrible idea. And go to the next one. And my first layers of paint are very thin. I end up uh, incorporating about 40 layers of paint in a painting um, over the progress of the painting. So it takes about 40 days uh, for each layer to dry in between. Um, this is the first layer. You can see the underpainting is a very different color than what it was, what it's meant to end up as, and that's on purpose. Um, every layer that I paint shows through in some way at the end, um, and the buildup creates this feeling that um, there is a timelessness a timelessness to it and a quality of, of depth and resonance that I don't think I would get if I just um, painted in one sitting. I can go to the next slide. Um, and then here I am blocking in color, starting to outline the shapes. Um, the colors continue to develop. They get lighter and darker in various areas. And um, they start to, I start to add details and look at the overall composition and always comparing it to the sketch um, that I started with. And go to the next one. And then the colors change ever so slightly. I, I um, told you in the beginning how they started out warm and now they're, they're turning more cool. Um, I watch the painting a lot at this stage and I make sure that it's something that it's developing the way I want it to. In this case, I noticed that the sky becoming very gray and dreary was, was sort of ominous and gave it a quality that I liked, but I wasn't sure I wanted to keep it there. So I kept going to make it more like the sketch. And um, if you show the next slide. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's one more after this. I forgot what order they were in. This gives you a sense of like how much planning goes into my, these are just a couple of the pages of, of several, many pages of notes. Um, on the left is my daily painting schedule, what colors I put down, what I, um, what I want to do next. Um, I actually, um, in, on the right side, you can actually see there's another series on the same page. I was sort of busy doing two different series at the same time. That one was called In Memoriam. Um, but it's a little it's a little nutty. I probably never go back and look at those, but I, for some reason, I like the idea of recording it and documenting it. And on the right is my diagram for how I was going to put these together, the dimensions, um, how they were going to be hung on the wall. Um, I wasn't entirely um, successful with that, but luckily CVA came through at the end and, and um, helped out. But but again, you know, who knew I needed this much math to make art? But um, I, you do. And if you go to the next slide, you can see some of the details. So then the, on the right are how the paintings look from the side. Um, some of the colors that you can see on the, in the middle where the, um, the, the depth of the color, the orange is coming through. Um, this is why it's nice to see work in person because you can see things like this that you wouldn't see in a regular slide. Um, you can also see how the panels fit together. It's not perfect. There is a little bit of a, a um, of a jarring quality or an interruption. 
Um, and on the left, you can see how, how I was painting them in my studio. I would um, usually paint upright, but then sometimes lay them down on my tables to, um, to either put a glaze on them or to separate them in some way and, and lay them flat because the, the paint that I use is very thin, almost like watercolor. You can go to the next one. And then here it is at CVA. And again, um, I just love the way all of the work, all of the Art Knots work um, fits together, how um, in the installation, the curation of this show, um, pieces are playing off, off of each other and resonating with each, with each other. I think each one of us, um, you know, approach this in a very unique way, and yet they all somehow work together through this theme of walls. And you can also get a sense of the scale here. Um, then you go to the next one, which will be my final slide. Um, and this is how it how it ended up in the end. And you can see it it actually turned out a little bit bluer than the original sketch and as it was going um, in the progress photos. But I really liked this blue quality, um, this sort of hopeful feeling, um, this sort of soft yet stark um, element that it had. And um, the dark panels didn't get as dark as I expected them to, but I wanted, I liked the way that you could see what was happening and to give them a feeling of hope and um, sort of a magical landscape that is interrupted, which is which is unfortunate. But I think overall, I wanted to express this idea of um, hope and the beauty of the landscape and the resonance of, um, you know, the idea of, of going to somewhere um, better. And hopefully we're headed in some, uh, our country is he headed in a better place. Um, and to make that connection between the personal and the and the universal and perhaps also the political. So that's that's all, the end of my talk. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Thank you, Trina. That was fantastic. Um, <laughs> it's so cool to see the process and the different steps yeah. um, that Thank you go through. And I have to say that the layering of the paint really gives it this shimmering quality when you see it in person mm -hmm. that I associate with like a heat shimmer in yeah. that you would see in the desert. So it's so cool that you can pull that off. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And you do see that heat shimmer in the desert. And I have to say on my many trips to Arizona with my mother and being down there, I'm always struck by that stark, um, bright, clarity of the landscape there and um, definitely wanted to evoke some of that and to give it that life that I feel like it it has. It looks like a desert, a dry wasteland when you first look at it, but it's it's anything but. It's much more than that. Yeah, it really comes through with your painting. So that was very yeah. interesting to see the process. So we do have a few questions. Um, Kristen <laughs> asks if you had considered using a different material for your substrate considering the metal of the border wall? Uh, no, not really. I mean, I, I, I considered it, but I didn't want it to make it a copy or a mere illustration of the wall. I didn't try to duplicate what a wall looks like in the landscape, obviously. Um, but I did want to get a sense of the scale and this interruption of the landscape or the barrier effect of the, of the, of the wall in the landscape. Um, my usual substrate is wood, so it was a material I was familiar with. I also was trying to consider the practical um, implications of using a material, and as it was, the wood was fairly heavy. I think you guys would have murdered me if it was metal and you had to hang that. Um, so, <laughs> so no, no, not for this painting, but I did want to keep the dimensions similar. Um, so Adrian asks, did you envision this piece as viewer facing north or south? I think it's universal. I think you can, you can, I mean, I didn't really, again, want to make an illustration. This is not a real place and a real, you know, a real wall. Um, but I think the idea of looking north and you are a family perhaps that that is, you know, doesn't have enough to eat or needs to do something to make your lives better that it would be, you know, something that you would look forward to as hopeful. Um, it's, it's a tragic situation no matter how you look at it. So I'm trying to, to perhaps paint it in a better light, but also draw attention to it. 
And I think I know Valerie talked a lot about the art knots and what we stand for, but we are talking, we, we are using art for social change. We don't, we don't, um, we're not standing on soapboxes and shouting, but we do paint. We use art, art is our voice for expressing these ideas. And in a time that's so uncertain and turmoil ridden that you can actually do something and paint something feels somewhat cathartic um, and somewhat helpful and hopeful. Thank you for that. Um, we have another comment from Heather. She says, thanks for talking so much about your process. I am outraged and delighted. <laughs> that's I exactly all... how I hope you feel. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I would definitely uh, echo that same feeling. The work is delightful. The sentiment behind it or the the issue behind it is outrageous and mm -hmm. really devastating. But I love that you talk about um, the way you um, reverse the positive and negative and you didn't just paint it as black as an obstacle, but actually left it as... Um, an emblem as for hope. And that was really beautiful. And I love that, love that idea. Um, and one observation I had was that um, the way you, the, the striations of the painting in the different panels, not only implies the form of the, the border fence, but also the cactus in a way itself. Yeah. When you show that original cactus, I was like, oh, wow, that, you know, really has that same kind of form to it. It's, yeah. And I don't know, I mean, I didn't show any other work, but if you go to my Instagram or my website, you'll see I often do break up things in vertical, you know, format. Um, it's a it's a shape that I'm drawn to. Um, the idea of a cactus being a barrier in and of itself is not lost to me as well. I mean, they're thorny things. It can be dangerous, but they can also be quite beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for that, Trina. Really great to have you with us yeah. tonight. Thank you so much. This has been a wonderful show to be part of, and I'm looking forward to hearing everyone else talk too. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. <laughs> okay, so we will introduce the next speaker, um, Andrea Gordon. Andrea was born and raised in Denver, Colorado. She studied economics at Colorado College with an unofficial minor in art history. After college, Andrea earned her law degree from the University of Denver College of Law. While raising her three children, she occasionally practiced law and also started her own mortgage closing business. In 2010, Andrea began to pursue her lifelong passion for art by becoming a full-time artist. She has since taken many classes at Denver's Art Students League, where she continues to study art in a variety of mediums and genres. Andrea is an emerging painter, participating in juried shows and art, market, art markets in Denver, and she has been um, a member of the Art Knot since 2015. So Andrea, good to see you. Thank you. So I will much. let you take it from here. Thank you. It's uh, really um, such a, a privilege for me to be a part of Art Knots and to um, be a part of this show at CBA. Being part of Art Knots has really been a great challenge for me, a great learning experience. Um, and I feel really fortunate to uh, be a part of this collective. I learned so much from every show we participate in. And I've been lucky enough to um, travel to one of the shows in Sarajevo, which was really a life-changing experience. Um, it was unbelievable. Um, my piece for this show, um, I when I, first uh, thought about what to do for the show, of course, uh, was before COVID. And I really had in mind only the wall along the Mexico border. And honestly, um, what I ended up making for this show was my plan B. My plan, my initial plan was to use light to create a three-dimensional um, sort of light area that would have uh, some sort of wall-like uh, component to it. And I wanted to put it in a space in the gallery where um, visitors would have to think about whether they should walk through the light or walk around the light. And so the idea for that and the idea for the piece that I ultimately made are really the same, which is 
all human beings have their own issues, whether they're based on the way you were raised or they're based on fears that you developed over time, or maybe they're just situational to specific moments in time. But we all put up walls at some point. And especially in this current political climate, it seems like the walls that we tend to put up, regardless of which side you fall on, um, they're becoming more and more impenetrable. And they're becoming far more impenetrable than any physical wall that Trump is building. And so I really wanted to speak to that, to um, this idea that we could and we all should really take a moment to consider the walls that um, we have within ourselves and question them and think about how um, they affect how we interact in life in really every situation. Because it's not the physical wall along the border that's really the, the most significant issue. It's um, the attitudes um, that people have that would make them want to build that wall. Um, so I really wanted my piece to speak to that. And I, I didn't have um, the technical know-how and wasn't able to figure out in time or make it work in the space at CVA to use the light idea. So then I ended up deciding to paint a mannequin that is supposed to represent really people in general, not any particular sex or kind of person. Um, and I happened to use the figure of a woman because... Um, within the time that I had to then create the piece, um, I wasn't able to find sort of a, a, an asexual kind of uh, mannequin that would be more easily read as representing all people. I actually hope that we're able to travel with this show and that I can make more pieces and incorporate other mannequins of different um, body types, all different body types, have a, a number of mannequins and paint them all in different kinds of patterns. And each person would then have their own patterns that would really kind of be specific. Like we all have our own issues that um, uh, that are, can be our walls. Every mannequin would be painted differently um, to represent that, you know, the whole variation of walls that we can all come up with. And as it turns out, the uh, painting a mannequin like this is um, much more similar to how I paint a lot of my abstract work anyway, using these uh, patterns that um, overlay each other and, um, and wind in and out of one another. Um, so that's really what this piece is about, just the walls that we all put up and um, hoping that it might um, make people think twice about your own wall and um, how impenetrable those walls are that you might put up in any given situation. Thank you for talking us through that, Andrea. It's really interesting to hear how this came from your original plan A, but now that you mention it, I do, I, it totally makes sense to see how the projection onto the body is shown in this piece. Um, so you have the brick wall and the street paint and the barbed wire all projected onto the body. I think it's, um, it, it seems like a very natural progression from that original idea that you had that you weren't able to realize in the short time that you had to plan for this show, but I hope you get to figure that one out because that sounds very interesting too. Um, I also really was struck by what you said about um, attitudes being more obstructive than actual walls. That's really um, a poignant statement. And I'm wondering if you would talk about that a little bit more. Well, it seems um, just really, especially in our, current political climate that um, it's the attitudes that are really um, holding us back more than anything else. Um, it's preventing us from really ha engaging in constructive conversations and finding constructive ways to deal with issues. I mean, I it's natural that 
people have different attitudes about different subjects and don't necessarily agree. Um, but because of um, these strong convictions, the people seem they keep getting stronger. It seems like that we're not able to um, find ways then to work through issues together the way that, I mean, we have to, we have no choice really. And, you know, I did come up with this idea thinking about the wall, but then when COVID came along, um, you know, that's a whole nother, and it became a political thing. I mean, I don't know how a pandemic can become so political, really. It shouldn't. Mm -hmm. And so that's another example of um, how these walls are um, becoming barriers. And then, you know, the ultimate, at least in the United States right now, is the um, Black Lives Matter um, and uh, having to face, um, you know, the systemic racism in, in the country. And some people just can't seem to get there. Um, and so the, and so this piece became just relevant to everything that, um, is happening currently for us. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's even the division of the masks you know, yeah. and the way people respond to the mask. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. I really a poignant um, comment that you made. Uh, so we do have a couple questions that I'll read. From one from Kristen, she said, "Having been on the installation team, I was responsible for moving the mannequin around the space, and there was never a great place to grab it, <laughs> to carry it. Um, it was kind of bizarre moving the human form, imposing our will upon it." Did you find yourself experiencing any moments where it was emotionally jarring painting these borders on a human form? No, I didn't really experience that. Um, I really enjoyed painting this three-dimensional object. It was a it was a fun challenge, but um, for me, it, it never resonated that I was painting kind of on a human form. For me, it was more just a three-dimensional mm -hmm. object. Um, okay, and Adrian asks, could you talk about the yellow and black aspect of the pattern? I got that just from uh, you know, police barriers that um, you might see. Some of them are red and black sometimes, but most of the time you see them, they're yellow and black. And I was really thinking about the protests at that time and, and uh, representing that um, that was really going on at the moment that I was painting that piece. Um, and then another question that I had for you was just about the experience in Sarajevo. You mentioned that it was life changing. So I, anytime someone has a life changing experience, I love to hear about it. Um, it was just one of those times that I think because I was there with Art Knots. And so we had this entree into a group of artists there that really immediately we had a connection with. And um, I think because of that, our conversation maybe was a, a bit more intimate. And I got to spend quite a bit of time with one artist in particular who, as it turned out when we got there, I think only two weeks previously, he had been attending the war crime, tr the war crime trial of one of the people who was accused of killing his dad during the war. And just to be able to hear about those kinds of personal experiences and then see how he um, has, how he is as a human being after uh, living through that experience. I mean, he's a young man, much younger than I am, and he doesn't seem to have an ounce of bitterness in him mm -hmm. despite that. And just learning about um, the war that um, they all went through and um, seeing them come through that with such great open hearts and spirit was just amazing. Wow, that sounds incredible. It is amazing when people who live in war torn places, how they, how we can't even imagine how they carry on. Yeah. And here we are heading into uh, not war torn, but just a, a lot more. Um, divisiveness than we've experienced in a long time and still people have it so much more extreme and so much worse and carry on it's really inspiring yeah yeah it was inspiring to be there and to uh, meet these people and to see how they've moved on and and keep moving forward yeah okay we have another question from heather 
Um, she says, great interpretation. You may be said, but I wondered, did you fashion the head? While unisex, did you find yourself focused on anyone in particular? Did you struggle to make it not represent anyone specifically? Um, well, I did choose, um, I, I mean, I was really looking for patterns that would represent different kinds of barriers, but I did intentionally want to make it not seem particularly male or female or any one kind of person in particular, which is kind of hard to do with, with a form that's so clearly and strongly female. But that's what I had to work with at the time. And somebody else brought to my attention that in fact, having that um, sort of idealized form of a female is in a way a different kind of wall that our society puts up saying, you know, if you don't fit this ideal, then you're kind of not in the cool kids club or whatever. But uh, when I was making the piece, I really wanted it as much as possible to not represent any type of person. I wanted it to feel more universal. I would say in a way that it does. I mean, like you mentioned, it has the um, stereotypical female form, but um, because of the way you took the pattern over the face, it does lose that sort of um, individual recognizable aspects. Yeah, I guess I did try to um, paint the pattern in a way that would um, de-emphasize any particular body type or, you know, aspect of the female figure. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing about your work and your process and how you came to create this work. We love having it in the space. And Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, we'll introduce our next artist, Robin Hextrom. Let's see, Robin is a contemporary oil painter who lives and works in the Denver area. She grew up in a small coastal town called Stinson Beach in North California, where she developed a passion for the natural environment. During her undergraduate studies at USC, she completed a double major in fine art and neuroscience, while also rowing on the varsity women's crew team. Following this diverse experience, she studied at Laguna College of Art and Design, where she received her MFA in painting. She then completed a second master's degree in modern and contemporary art history at UC Riverside. Her paintings represent a fusion of her traditional art training with her knowledge of art history and art theory. Robin is now an assistant professor of visual art at Regis University. She has gallery representation at Abend Gallery in Colorado. Robin has exhibited her paintings across the country and is the recipient of grants from the Elizabeth Green Shields Foundation and the Strobart Foundation. So thank you very much for joining us tonight, Robin, and I will let you take it away. Yeah, thank you so much, Cecily. I really appreciate um, your hosting and I really appreciate the CBA for organizing this. Um, I'd also like to say I really appreciate the talk so far by Valerie, Trina, and Andrea. Um, it's always so nice to just hear directly from the artist um, your thought process and, and get a little bit more into that um, deeper layer of content and, and process within your work. Um, I'd also like to make a shout out to my drawing students. We have class right now, so they are attending class this way. <laughs> Um, so I thought this would be really good for them to see and just see examples of contemporary artists exploring really meaningful issues. Um, getting into my artwork, uh, the painting that I created is a four by five foot oil painting and it's titled Open Borders. Um, so with this painting, I was really looking at the possibility of opening up barriers and boundaries, whether those barriers are social, political, or physical. Um, and I'm really, as a lot of the artists have already spoken about here, equally concerned about the human rights violations that we've seen in response to the refugee crisis, to asylum seekers at the border. That's been um, a recent development within the new administration under Trump is that we're now turning away people seeking asylum um, and generally just having very harsh immigration restrictions. Um, and for me personally, it just, it really recalls the fact that in US history, we turned away Jewish refugees during the Holocaust. 
you know, when we look back at that historical event, it feels so um, horrifying. And yet, you know, how are we repeating some of those really problematic historical decisions um, to not open our country and help others? Um, so when I was thinking about how to approach this, rather than going down um, a more kind of dark or sobering direction, I decided I wanted to create a more celebratory work about a positive alternative present and or future. Um, so within this painting, you see lots of really vibrant birds and butterflies, and I've included those because those symbolize migration. Um, so the birds and butterflies are crossing the borders while human bodies cannot. Um, and the butterflies have been a really um, consistent symbol of immigrant rights um, that you've seen on different posters and protest signs. So I wanted to include um, tons of birds and butterflies in here to really have that um, symbolism. Um, and, you know, when I was deciding what kinds of birds to paint, I um, decided to paint birds that um, span or live in either, um, you know, North America, Central or South America to comment on the U.S.-Mexico border um, and to have this really harmonious sense between all of these different um, birds coming from different areas in a single space. Um, and you'll also see in this painting these kind of floating spheres. Um, so I wanted to create um, these kind of masses of um, exploding, uh, you know, vegetation, plants, and flowers um, to represent um, different nations or countries and to have these um, somewhat self-contained but still interconnected worlds. Um, so that's why I chose to have the vines connect between the different floating spheres. Um, and then the flowers in the work um, represent the possibility of um, beauty and growth within this new worldview. Um, so we have um, in general, just this really kind of lively, lush um, and you know, really vibrant representation of a new perspective that we could take on. Um, and that also goes for having a really bright, clear blue sky in the background to have another kind of layer of optimism in the work um, and just the overall vibrancy of the colors further support this kind of um, optimistic mood that I'm going for in the piece. Um, so one of the reasons that I decided to take um, more of a perspective of um, celebration of the possibility of eliminating borders as opposed to actually focusing on the borders themselves is I've always, I thought it's really interesting um, what the author and climate activist Naomi Klein has mentioned where she says um, that no is not enough. So she has a, a whole book that that's <laughs> is that title, right? Um, but in her argument, it's no is not enough. We can't just constantly criticize and shoot down. Um, while that criticism is really important and really necessary, we also have to think about winning over hearts and minds with beautiful possibilities that lie ahead of us if we take the right steps towards supporting each other. So that was something I was really thinking about with this piece is how can we have this much more bright and optimistic future um, with the possibility of new immigration policies and more free exchange between nations. Um, so that's why I've titled the piece um, Open Borders um, to really give this sense of um, openness, possibility, um, and kind of free exchange and freedom of um, movement within the work. Um, so yeah, so thank you so much for having me. That concludes my portion of the talk. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has about my painting. Thank you, Robin. Um, it's such a beautiful piece and uh, it was great to hear you speak about it. I love, I love the idea of open borders and, um, and with the, the way the piece is displayed in the gallery, it's right next to Michael Dixon's work which depicts children behind cages. So 
it's very um, striking to see the way the birds and uh, butterflies can just freely um, cross borders and such a beautiful sentiment. And I also love that you brought up the, um, the book, No is Not Enough, and the, the idea that we can't just be critical because it's, it's very easy to be critical these days, um, but bringing some possibilities for solution and getting past what the problems are is is really important and poignant. Also, just the idea of interconnected worlds. We think so much about, at least from my perspective, there's so much talk about the border between U.S. and Mexico. And we think about the fence and the, the, the barriers for people to come in, even legally and financially, and the danger it, it, they face coming over. But the way that our worlds really are interconnected and it's just an arbitrary line drawn up by a war and the land continues, the people continue. And um, so I really love that you are speaking about it as interconnected worlds. We have um, a question that I will read to you. Um, Let's see, for some reason, I cannot see the whole question. There we go. I can't, this is from Kristen. I can't help to draw a correlation to traditional Dutch still life paintings of flowers and domestic items. The flowers within the bouquets would in nature never bloom or exist at the same time or in the same place, which really speaks to the freedom of travel and celebration of far off places. Your luminescent renderings are stunning and remind me of those flowers. Um, Were these Dutch still life a, a source of inspiration for you? Yeah, thank you so much, Kristen, for that question. And the answer is resoundingly yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, so, and you'll see that in um, a lot of my work, you can probably see in the paintings that are just in the background of me while I'm talking to my studio here. Um, you know, I, I just have a love and fascination for that tradition of Dutch still life painting. I find them so exquisite and um, I was really drawn to those and continue to be drawn to those for, you know, my whole body of work, but also for this painting. Um, and, you know, I, I think I also have like mixed feelings about that tradition, right? Because on one hand, it's like so exquisite and beautiful, but on the other hand, there's messaging within some of those Dutch still lives that it really promotes colonization and destruction of other countries. Um, so there's a lot of a kind of mixture of light and dark in there. Um, so in a way, this is kind of, um, you know, I think one could interpret it as like reclaiming that iconography in a way of like celebrating and supporting nations as opposed to just this sense of like um, one nation like dominating over another. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for that question. And and your eye was spot on. It's ab- absolutely yes. <laughs> um, okay, so we have two more questions. Oh, actually, they're pouring in now. Okay. Heather says, wow, that's amazing. So many complexities. If you want, can you talk a little bit about your process, how you lay your paint down? Yeah, absolutely. So um, it really depends on the kind of painting that I'm making. So um, some of the kinds of paintings I've been doing recently, I've been incorporating more abstraction. And in that case, I'm starting with an abstract background and building representational elements and kind of working back and forth. Um, For this painting, um, typically what I'm doing is starting with um, really simply like blocking in um, an underpainting and really simple colors and values, um, and then gradually adding more layers and resolving that. Um, If you're familiar with the term um, direct versus indirect painting, Um, you know, I'm doing direct more like a la prima in the first phases where it's, you know, working with paint into paint. And then the the very last layer, that's when I'll add transparent glazes um, to just get a little bit more luminosity. Um, But it definitely makes these pieces quite time intensive because each little flower or bird I'm having to paint is going to take three or four layers of paint um, to really get that finish. Um, So I was actually working on this painting on and off basically for this last year. Um, And I'll work on multiple paintings at the same time, Um, but I'm basically building up from simple to complex. Um, And I'm also organizing the composition um, 
somewhat intuitively. So I, you know, don't really have very detailed sketches. I tend to work more within like a response to what's happening with the painting. And I kind of add elements as I start to see them um, being necessary. That's great to hear. It's so interesting, the different processes that you incorporate into your work. Um, so Kristen has an add on to her question about the Dutch still life. And she says, also the desires of the women who painted the domestic scenes to leave the home. So that's a really interesting um, comment just about flight and freedom of movement. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, um, it's been interesting because I think I know it's like being a female artist, I was at first like a little nervous to like paint so much floral imagery. And I actually had um, one of my grad school professors told me that I would never get a teaching job if I submitted a portfolio of images that contained flowers because male faculty would see it and just shut it down. <laughs> um, so it's been kind of, I don't know, it's been kind of fun. That's something I kind of like with my painting is like taking something that I don't know, some people could see as cliche or stereotypical and trying to kind of reclaim it and give it my own voice and, and just, you know, go with it and really, really run with it and, and stop letting those kind of voices in my head dictate, this is okay, this is not okay, this will work, this, this won't work. So I, I definitely appreciate that comment. Well, it's funny, I think we all have a story of some um, advice that we've gotten in, from <laughs> teachers or professors that, you know, have been stuck with us for the good and the bad. Um, so that that's funny. I wonder, did you submit images of floral paintings to Regis when you applied? I did, and I got the job, so it was really <laughs> validating. <laughs> I love it. Uh, just have that people like, okay, you know, uh, sometimes people who display themselves as experts aren't always the expert in that field, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, and um, yeah, that's just, that's fantastic. So I love that you were able to reclaim that. <clears throat> um, okay, we have another comment, possibly question from Valerie. I appreciate your use of flight and transformation by using butterflies, birds, and flowers. It really does give a sense of hope. Yeah, thanks, Valerie. I agree with that comment. Um, so yeah, that, it's fantastic. I hope everyone gets a chance to come down and see it. And to the Regis Drawing students, come see us, come see the show. We are open um, and we'd love to meet you. And hear your thoughts on the show. So Robin, have you made it down to CVA yet? I have, yeah. Um, and it's an exquisite exhibition. I, I was really, really impressed with it. Um, it was so interesting having this, um, you know, call for the show and, you know, you kind of working on your own stuff for a while. And, and I was just so curious what the other artists were gonna do. Um, and I was just so impressed by the diversity of approaches that people took to the same issue and the diversity of perspectives that people represented. Um, and yeah, I found it really moving, really um, powerful exhibition to see, um, you know, regardless of the self-promotion aspect of it, I think it's really worthwhile to check out, especially in the times that we're in. Absolutely, I agree. Well, thank you so much, Robin, and thanks to the other speakers we had tonight, um, Valerie, Andrea, and Trina. It was so fantastic to see all of your faces and hear about your work. I hope everyone gets a chance to come down and see us. Um, we do have two more evenings of Artist Talks, um, which I posted a link in the, the uh, conversation in the chat. Um, but if you can't find it in the chat, you can just go to CBA's website and click on events and you'll find a link there. We also send out information in our newsletter so you can sign up to get on our mailing list and get information there. And tomorrow night we have a really fun event um, that will also be online. It's called um, Socially Distant Culture Club and it's um, an art making happy hour from the comfort of your own home, but it's really fun. Um, not intimidating at all. Lots of people have said, oh, I didn't know if I should go, but it's 
it's very low key and fun. And we'll be looking at the exhibition called Revealing, which is in our 965 project gallery. It's a student curated space. And so we'll be looking at that exhibition and getting inspiration and making artwork from that. So you can find out more information about that on our website as well. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here this evening. And I hope you make it down and see us at CVA.